Folks, welcome back to another episode of the IMGPH podcast. Now, have we ever wondered about interventions, the human behavioral influence on the public health world? Well, today's guest is going to be a treat and educate us all about it. Professor Linda Collins is a professor at the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences and the director of CADIO, the Center, of Advance, Center for Advancement and Dissemination of Intervention, Intervention Optimization. It's an amazing center here that is going to be hosting an event soon alongside the GPH Department of Social and Behavioral Science. And to talk all about it and interventions today, we have Professor Linda Collins. Welcome to the IMGPH podcast. Thank you. It's really great to be here. Glad to have you as well. Why don't we hop right in and talking about interventions? What is an intervention? How does one even describe an intervention? Yeah. Yeah, the way I think of interventions, uh, they are a program that is designed to uh, alter someone's behavior so that uh, it will prevent uh, disease or uh, possibly cure disease. So pu- these interventions uh, are hugely important in public health. When you think of um, the effect of behavior on health, um, millions and millions of lives are lost every year because of behaviors like cigarette smoking, excessive alcohol use, uh, failure to engage in enough physical activity, uh, illicit drug use, uh, things like uh, failure to uh, stay in good control of diabetes. I could go. I could go on and on. There's many, many, many uh, public health issues that are directly tied to human behavior. Okay, so interventions is one side of it, kind of making a change, for, if I understand correctly. So where do, where do the humans, I believe this is all about humans at a large degree, right? So where does the human factor come into place? How would you describe that? Yes, well, of course, uh, people want to be healthy. And, uh, and most people know what they have to do to lose weight or, or to stop smoking. But it's hard uh, to do those things. People sometimes need help uh, gaining motivation or gaining skills. Uh, sometimes a pharmaceutical is involved. Uh, for example, if someone is depressed, uh, talk therapy may be very helpful, but also an antidepressant um, might be used in conjunction with talk therapy. So a lot of interventions are behavioral, but they may also, uh, some interventions may also be what we call biobehavioral because they have uh, both a, a strictly behavioral and also a biological or, or pharmaceutical component. In fact, most of these interventions are multi-component. They have a lot of moving parts. You don't use just one strategy. You use a number of, of different strategies that are uh, trying to influence different aspects of the problem. So that, that, sounds, that sounds amazing, right? Like how we tackle these things. Could you give us some, so maybe, maybe some things you have seen and uh, problems that you might have tackled or the, what we see in the world when it comes to this, this, this part of public health. How, how does one describe it for a person that doesn't know much about it? Yeah, uh, well, I've been involved in, in empirical development of a number of different uh, behavioral interventions. But uh, one point I'd like to make is that uh, we in social and behavioral sciences are very excited about a new approach for doing this. So intervention science has been around for probably uh, 30 or 40 years, people have been taking uh, an empirical approach to developing uh, behavioral and biobehavioral interventions. And of course, behavioral theory uh, is brought into this. A number of different intervention components are developed based on, based on behavioral theory. And these components are put together to form uh, an intervention that is used to, to treat or prevent disease. Um, what we're excited about uh, is a new approach that solves what is really a worldwide problem with, with these interventions. Um, many interventions are developed without regard for whether they're practical. They're developed for what you might think of as potency. So, so an academic intervention science scientist uh, develops an intervention and is really going for the most effective intervention that they can get, which, and you might think, well, why not go for the most effective intervention you can get? That sounds great. That's what you should do. But the problem is that the most effective intervention you can get is very often not practical. It might be too expensive. It might be too complicated. It might be too burdensome for staff. And what's been happening for many years is a lot of promising interventions have been developed in academic settings, and they never are implemented. Or if they are implemented, they're implemented in kind of a detuned way. You know, a number of 
uh, of the components that were so important to the uh, scientists who developed the intervention are taken out because they, they're not affordable or, or the staff uh, can't do them because they find them too complicated or burdensome. And as a result, the potential of these interventions to reduce morbidity and mortality has just been severely compromised. And this is actually a worldwide problem. I was just, we have a visitor uh, from Denmark at uh, in the Cadio Center uh, this month, and I was just talking with her uh, uh, a couple of days ago. She's interested in interventions uh, in the area of cancer survivorship, that is, uh, helping people who have survived cancer to lead better lives um, a- after after uh, they are past the, the, the chemo and all the awful treatment that goes along with it, and even in um, even in Europe, uh, in Denmark, they're having the same problem where academics develop interventions, but then they never get implemented because they're just too costly or or too burdensome. And if if an intervention could be the most beautiful intervention you could think of, and the most potent intervention you can think of, but its public health impact would be exactly zero if it's never implemented. So what we're excited about is a new approach called intervention optimization that draws on ideas from a number of different fields, notably industrial engineering. Now, in industrial engineering, they develop products all the time, Mm -hmm. and they're developing products for sale, right? They want want, uh, practical products that actually can be used. And so the idea here is you optimize the intervention. And by that, I mean you start by looking at factors like what's the most this could cost and be implemented? How burdensome can it be for the staff where, so that they will really do it? Um, how burdensome can it be for the participants? How long can it be to be practical? Questions like this. You start getting that information and then you can use um, special research methods to investigate the performance of individual components of the intervention, and then you select a set of components that gives you the best expected outcome that will work within those parameters that, that for example, won't cost any more than, say, $500 or won't be any longer than 20 minutes to, to implement. So the idea is to develop interventions that are both potent and practical. And then those kinds of interventions have the potential for massive public health impact. Could you could you give us some examples of these interventions? Yes. Um, so if, if you uh, attend the event that we're talking about uh, that's coming up, you'll you'll hear some very nice examples of these kinds of interventions. But I've worked on uh, optimizing interventions in a number of different areas. Now it's still. So it's a very new approach, and it hasn't been uh, implemented uh, in that many areas yet, but I can give you some examples. Uh, one is smoking cessation. There's been quite a bit of work in this area, uh, in, in the area of, smoke, of smoking cessation. Uh, weight loss uh, in, in obese people. And I've worked on optimization of um, an intervention aimed at reducing uh, risky sex and excessive alcohol use in, in college students. And uh, among other among others, tomorrow uh, at, at not tomorrow uh, at at the inter at the at the event, uh, you'll hear about an intervention aimed at getting people who are HIV positive and not engaged in the healthcare system, engaged in the healthcare system and getting their viral load down by taking antiretrovirals properly. So those are just a few examples, but there's possibilities, you know, all over the place. I mentioned I was just talking to someone who's doing work in cancer survivorship. I know of people who are doing work in sleep. Uh, I know of someone else who, who is developing a special uh, intervention aimed at people who are um, heavy drug users and HIV positive. Uh, the uh, people who uh, use drugs often have cognitive impairment. And the issue there is to develop an intervention that can work for people who have cognitive impairment so that these folks can get their, their viral load down. So that's just a few examples, but there's, there's so many. I mean, uh, the, in the, the, this, this approach applies to every area of public health. You mentioned this one thing uh, which, which stood out to me, right? Industrial engineering was one area. It seems yeah. like this part of public health is interconnected to industries we might not even consider that public health is a part of. What, what, what stands out to you when it comes to interconnectedness in our globe when, and public health with different industries, different mindsets? 
Yes. Pub, one of the things I, I love about public health, and I should say I, I'm pretty new to NYU. This is only my third year here. And this is my first uh, faculty appointment in a school of uh, public health. I was I was in other other schools uh, before I came here. But I really love uh, the interdisciplinarity of, of public health. Um, this approach uh, for optimizing interventions that I've been working on for a number of years draws on ideas from, from industrial engineering, uh, behavioral science, um, health economics, uh, and Bayesian decision analysis. It, it integrates ideas from all, all of those areas. And in the past, I've had, um, I've had grants with, uh, with engineers where we worked on problems together. So um, I really love doing interdisciplinary work. Okay, engineers. We we've had we've had different types of engineers on this podcast as well, and it it shows us mm-hmm. that how interconnected public health is. The whole mindset mm-hmm. around public health is much beyond what the term health might be, and how we consider oh, that. Yeah, it absolutely is. And one thing about public health, it has a very kind of let's get it done attitude, mm. which I think is is really healthy. And uh, sometimes to get it done, uh, you have to talk to people who are outside your area, mm. and that's I think a very healthy thing. Can you can you tell us more about CADIO? Yeah, yeah. So CADIO, as you said, is a center for advancement and dissemination of, of intervention optimization. And we do a number of different things. Uh, those of us who are faculty in the center are, uh, many of us are working on actually advancing the science of intervention optimization itself. Uh, for example, um, one of the junior faculty in the center is working on ways of decision making. Um, when you're looking at the performance of a number of different intervention components, you might actually have a very complicated decision-making problem on your hands, and this may be further complicated if you have more than one outcome that, you, that you're considering, because the different outcomes um, may have to be weighted. Sometimes the results will contradict each other o- over the different uh, um, outcomes you might be looking at. So it can become very complicated, and uh, she's been drawing on ideas from Bayesian decision science to develop an approach to help investigators who are facing those really complicated decisions. A number of affiliates of the center are applying uh, intervention optimization in some really interesting areas. Uh, one uh, faculty member in the center is, is applying intervention optimization in the area of, of child maltreatment, for example. And something else we do a lot is educate other science, scientists about intervention optimization. This is still a pretty new area. And uh, it's not taught in very many graduate programs. In fact, it's not taught in any graduate programs uh, at all that I know of, not even NYU, although we, we are uh, in the process of developing courses and we will soon be teaching courses uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in, in SBS. Um, but we uh, have a course on the Coursera platform. It's free to anyone who's interested in it. And we also do that. That's that's an asynchronous course. We also do synchronous trainings based on that asynchronous course. These are trainings for people who already have a PhD and are interested in retooling to apply intervention optimization ideas in in their work. Um, intervention optimization is considered uh, kind of radical by by some people. It's quite different from uh, same old same old that was done for many years. But uh, since, since 2016, the amount of National Institutes of Health funding that's been uh, devoted to intervention optimization has gone, on, has gone up by more than 400%. So there is a lot of uh, interest being generated in, in this area now. What, what about it has become radical? How, what, what, what makes people say that? Um, the MO uh, in intervention science uh, for many years has been to take all the components that go into uh, a behavioral or biobehavioral intervention and then immediately test that package of components as a package uh, in, in a pretty simple experiment uh, where you would uh, randomly assign uh, some people to get the treatment and some people to get some kind of a control. Now, that is an important thing to do at certain points in the process. But the downside to, to sole reliance on that kind of an experiment is that you, you're not looking inside the intervention at all. You don't have any idea which of the components are performing the way you want them to and which are not. 
So you re- first of all, you don't have any way to make the intervention better because you don't know which are the weak components and which are the strong components. You don't know whether the effect that you observed, if you do in fact observe an effect, is due to maybe only one out of eight or ten components. So you have a huge amount of waste in there, components that are doing nothing but but taking up resources and wasting people's time. And then, this is, I think, probably the most tragic part. If that experiment, the result, if the results of that experiment suggest that the package doesn't work, you have no idea why. Hmm. So you're just kind of left with, well, this was a failure, and I don't know whether there's any components in there that are worth saving, and so I just have to go back to the, the drawing board. On the other hand, if you are using uh, an intervention optimization perspective, you're not going to go directly to that kind of an experiment. Instead, you're going to conduct an experiment that, that and, there, and there are lots and lots of experimental designs that enable this, that, ena- that enable you to look at the effects of the individual components and also whether the presence or absence of one component might have an impact on the effectiveness of another component. That, that's an important question. And so you know which components work, which ones aren't working. You don't have to include any components that aren't working. And so you can develop an economical and efficient intervention. And there's um, a basic principle that we like to talk about in intervention optimization called continual optimization. Mm -hmm. And this means that you keep improving the intervention incrementally over time, which, which you really, you really can't do that using the, uh, the traditional approach. So I want to tell you something that's kind of funny. Uh, When I uh, speak to intervention scientists, which I do a lot about these ideas, I routinely get people coming up to me after and saying, you just blew my mind. This is so radical. People have posted memes uh, like on Twitter after I talk of like exploding heads and stuff like that. Linda Collins just, just blew my mind. So that's the reaction I get from intervention scientists. When I talk to literally anyone else, literally anyone else who's not in the field of intervention science, they always say, you mean that's not how you do it already? <laughs> Wow. So to, to everyone else, it just seems like common sense. But to people in, in, uh, in intervention science, just because of the way they've been trained, these ideas often seem very radical. But once, once people get it, they never go back. This is huge, right? This is very important for the industry, especially with the things that are happening in the world, that the structure or the structure that we have been following are is mm-hmm. essentially doing more harm than good, even though it was there in, in the good place. So how do we change the way we yeah. think? Yes, uh, I I agree with you um, that it that this has the potential to be a paradigm shift, and in Cadio we are doing our best to um, help intervention scientists who wish to do so to retool so that they can use uh, these approaches. Most intervention scientists have been trained in the simple experiment I talked about, where you compare the package to a control. They haven't been trained so much in optimization trial design. And optimization trials, you know, admittedly, they're, they're more complex, uh, but the scientific yield is enormous because you've mm-hmm. just learned so much about uh, what aspects of, of the intervention are working and, and which are not. And uh, I believe that if we start doing more optimization trials, which of course, I, you know, everything, everything I do is aimed at trying to get people to, to, uh, do more optimization trials that will start to build a coherent base of knowledge about what works and what doesn't work, which they have in other fields. You know, other fields have been building uh, coherent bases of knowledge, but we have, we're, we're, I'm not saying we're not doing it now, but it's been very, very slow mm-hmm. in intervention science. And I believe that this would, would really speed it up. I have, when, I, when reading about, about intervention optimization and the whole, the whole department, I, I'm curious to know the difference between intervention optimization and implementation science. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, first, I want to mention that there's a great center devoted to implementation science uh, in GPH, the Global uh, Center for Implementation Science. Uh, um, so we have a lot of lot of uh, great work going on in that area. Uh, the, the two, I think, are are very complementary. Uh, implementation science is about the study of how best to implement interventions, as, as the name implies. And intervention optimization 
is about developing interventions that are readily implementable. Now, of course, once an intervention is developed uh, and optimized so that it's readily Im- implementable, there may still be important things you can do to improve the, implement- the implementation of, of the intervention. Also, uh, I want to mention that in some cases, you can think of uh, an intervention's implementation, the process of implementing it, almost like an intervention on the intervention. And if you look at it that way, then you can, then you can uh, optimize that. So it's possible to use intervention optimization ideas to uh, optimize intervention implementation if that doesn't seem too meta. <laughs> yeah, intervention inception, it seems like. And it's it's very similar to the radical approach that you were talking about, right? It, it seems like that's kind of what we're doing at this point. Yes. So, you know, Professor, I have one one last question because a lot of people listening to this earlier, I want to circle back to this one thing. There, there are people that might be watching this episode that necessarily don't have a public health background, but are very interested in the concept of public health. They might be engineers, they might be artists, they might be mm-hmm. from wherever all over the world. Is there is there more of a space for someone that might be a generalist? So there's lots of students that are multifaceted or people that want to come to GPAs that have come from culinary backgrounds, dance mm-hmm. backgrounds. We've seen all kinds of guests on this podcast mm-hmm. as well. Uh, mm-hmm. is, how does is this a great is this a great area? Why do you think this might be an area for generalists to find their spaces rather than only them thinking it's a specialist? I I, I do think uh, public health is a great area for people with uh, almost any skill set. Of course, it depends on on exactly what you want to do. But a lot of public health um, activities take place in community settings, and the kind of backgrounds you talked about, you know, the arts. Uh, dance, um, anthropology, mm. uh, for example, uh, those kinds of backgrounds, I think, uh, can be extremely helpful. Now, to get an MPH, uh, most of the time you have to take statistics, which, you know, I, I, I see that as, as a plus, And for me, that was always super fun. But I know that a lot of people find, find statistics um, a little scary. Um, but so I want to, uh, want to emphasize that, that that's a part of it because it, it's a science but, um, you know, I have to say the people um, I know who I respect the most um, are really good at integrating ideas from different areas. And so uh, I think that um, there's, there's definitely room for integration of ideas from ev- really pretty much every area of study that you can imagine. Love to hear that. I'm sure a lot of people would love to hear that and probably get rolling on understanding what public health means to them. So let's let's talk yeah, we about. We have a great MPH program, I should say, in, in GPH. We have a really great MPH program. Absolutely, and and for those of you folks listening as well, I am I myself am in the engineering school. I host this podcast, and I've learned so much hosting this podcast as well. There's room for mm-hmm. everyone. I've spoken to all kinds of people. So if you're interested in something like that in public health, please uh, check out any public health course for that matter. There's room for everyone in this industry. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Professor, why don't we hop into talking about the symposium that's going to be happening in a few weeks? Mm-hmm. Since, uh, for, first off, for those of you that are listening to this one year after the podcast is published, the symposium has is over at this point, but <laughs> it might be happening again. Who knows? But let's let's talk about what the symposium is. Yeah. So, so uh, this this is an um, activity that's organized by. Uh, the Social and Behavioral Sciences Department, and also um, in, in partnership with uh, with CADIO. And um, this is something that, uh, uh, keep an eye on this, because we've been talking about doing this every year. We, we, we call it our think tank. We did one last year. It was on displacement last year. And this one is on, uh, on intervention optimization. And there are plans to do one next year, too. So it uh, Keep, keep an eye on it because I think they're always super interesting. Uh, this one, as I said, it's about intervention optimization as an answer to the challenge of behavior change, which, you know, as we started out by saying, is so important because so much morbidity and mortality is, is directly related to behavior and could be stemmed by, be, by the right kind of, of behavior change. So um, I'm going to start off uh, this activity by giving a brief introduction to intervention optimization. And then we're going to have uh, a number of different speakers. Uh, One would be Maria Guads from the School of Social Work. 
Uh, another one will be Dr. Uh, Jen Cantrell, uh, who is in social and behavioral sciences. Dr. Stephanie Cook, who is in social and behavioral sciences. And Dr. Kate Guastafaro, who is in social and behavioral sciences. And they're all going to talk about optimization trials that they have done in, all, in different areas. E- each one of them is working in a different right. area. There will be time for discussion and questions and answers, and uh, then uh, we'll have a little reception. It'll be about two hours total. So from what I understand, everyone should really attend this event if they have any interest, right? Like they- Oh, yes, definitely. And it's going to be a hybrid event. Uh, any uh, NYU-affiliated folks are welcome to attend in person, uh, but anyone else at all is, is more than welcome to uh, register to attend, um, attend uh, by Zoom. So for those of you that are listening before this event, the event will take place on April 19th from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. The panel discussion happens from 2 p.m. to 3.30, and it's followed by a reception for those of you that will be in person, but it's hybrid, remember? So we'll have the link to the event in the description for those of you that are interested because it's a great way to learn about intervention optimization, case studies, Mm -hmm. industry professionals will give their opinions and you also have Professor Linda Collins over there to share their to share great insights for everyone. Mm-hmm. Professor Collins, what would you like to leave us with about intervention optimization as we end this podcast? Oh gosh, just that it's such an exciting area, and uh, there's new things happening all the time uh, in in this area. Uh, intervention science is just a great area uh, to be in right now. So much, so much is happening. Thank you for thank you for giving us all your insights and educating us and uh, hope this event runs smoothly and really well. It seems like it's going to be an exciting time. Thank you so much. All right, folks, we'll see you in the next episode. Till next time.